The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. The Gospel of the Lord. We bow your heads with me in prayer, please. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this glorious celebration that you have allowed us to share in. This morning, Lord, would you take our minds and think through them. Take our eyes and give us new lenses to see your truth. Take my lips to speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your son, Jesus. Take our wills and put them in submission to yours. In Jesus Christ's holy and blessed name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, again, Merry Christmas. We get to say that for four weeks because you never get tired of saying it. At least I don't. So Merry Christmas. It's great to see you all here and online. Welcome, Grace Church, this first Sunday after. As if you didn't notice, this is always the fun year, right? Christmas Eve is a Friday. Christmas Day is a Saturday. Then Sunday. So, whew, we're almost almost through the weekend. Praise God. It's great to be here, though. Um, I've been reflecting on... uh, you know, having children and, and passing on the traditions that I grew up with. And I realized something that I think we probably all know, that human beings, people are very habitual people, aren't we? I mean, some of you have been at this church for a long time. Some of you longer than I've been alive, and that's awesome. And you've been doing some of the same things that whole time. Some of you have your traditions. You know, I have mine that Bethany likes to laugh at. I don't know if you're going to watch this. She, I, when I do the tree... I played Johnny Mathis. I put on a little pot of cinnamon and nutmeg and make the house smell good because that's what I've been doing since I was a little kid. There are specific ornaments that go on the top of the tree. This is just, it makes me, I don't know, remember and smile and it it kind of brings me back. It it kind of removes time. And we do that, don't we? With with all sorts of habits. It's not just kind of the memories that we have, but we, we become habitual. It's, I think, something that we do to feel kind of safe, right? I eat almost the same lunch four or five days a week. Why? Because it's simple, it's easy, I don't have to think about it. And we do that a lot of things in life, not just in church, of course, and and general things like that, but we do it in our workspace. I'll give you an example that you have all, some of you, multiple times made notice of, our bulletins. Especially when we go from Pentecost to the next seasons, you see, when we in the office do the same bulletin every week for six months, you know what we become? It becomes a habit. And so when we edit it, we don't think, oh, there's something new. And that's why you see us miss something. It could be because we're lazy, but I'm going to say it's because we're habitual. We forget, oh, wait, it's a new season, so we need this new prayer, or we forgot this word over here. And so you see that in our workspaces and and all of you in your lives as well. You do the same thing all the time, and if somebody throws you a curveball, unless you're a really good hitter, you miss it. And that's okay. Habits are not a bad thing. You see this, of course, in movies. And, And this is a way to look at how being habitual 
unfortunately, one of the side effects is it causes us not to see deeper sometimes. We become so used to seeing the same thing all the time that we miss the details, right? We miss sometimes the deeper truths. One of my favorite movies, maybe one of the best movies of all time, Shawshank Redemption. If you haven't seen it, I don't know what you're doing here, but you should see it. It's an amazing story of, of kind of redemption. Anyway, the main character goes to jail, he's wrongly accused, and eventually he breaks out of jail. That's the short form of it. After he gets out of jail, his friend, who just happens to be Morgan Freeman, who narrates the story, tells you the backstory that you didn't see for the first hour and a half, how he broke out. And you see all these little things that you would have, if you were really looking, you may have noticed how he broke out of jail with his tools and the hole in the wall and all the things he was doing. But the one moment that I always remember, it's just amazing because I do it now because of the movie, is as he's leaving the warden's office at the end of the night before he's about to escape, he has taken the warden's clothes and put them underneath his clothes because when he escapes, he's going to go into town to all the banks where he has been laundering the warden's money and he's gonna take it. Well, he can't go in with convict clothes, so he needs a suit. So he wears the warden's suit underneath, including the warden's perfectly polished black shoes. And Morgan Freeman narrates, he says, I just didn't see it. And they show him walking into the, into the cell block, and he's got his jean jacket, his jean pants on, he looks like a convict, and then they pan down to his shoes. And Morgan Freeman goes, I mean, think about it. How often do you look at a man's shoes? Basically saying, if I had noticed he had shiny black shoes, I probably would have figured something else was going on. Because what happens, and especially, and they make this note in the movie, jail life is routine and habit all the time. Why would you look at a man's shoes? Ever since I've watched that movie, you know what I do sometimes? I'll be walking, I'll be like, all right, my shoes are clean, right? And I notice people's shoes now, it's crazy. But when we get habitual, we don't see things like that. And it requires in our lives, sometimes easy, more often than not hard, to break out of habits. We need somebody to wake us up, maybe a little slap on the cheek, light one, nothing difficult. We need new eyes, we need new light to shine into the story so that we can see what's going on. Now I personally have just had this experience with this whole idea of, of new eyes, literally. <laughs> A new lens, literally, I had cataract surgery, and many of you, some of you have had it as well. It's astounding how you can see in a new way when they give you the cataract. Before my cataract surgery, I was 2200 in this eye. If I didn't have my contact right now and I looked at you, you would just be a blob of color. Right now, I can actually see almost most of your faces. It's still a little tiny blurry, but it's 2030 now once I get my new contact. Right now it's about 2060. That's incredible. And what happens, as those of you who know and your eyes have gotten bad, when you can see more clearly, you can walk more truly, you can walk more right in the direction you need to go. You don't bump into things, you can find things, you drop on the floor, all because you can see clearly. Now God understands, doesn't he? God understands because he created us. He gave us all these gifts. He knows we're habitual. This is why almost the entire stream of scripture tells us over and over and over, what does God do? He knows we're habit people. He knows it's hard for us to wake up. He knows it's hard for us to see. He knows we're not gonna notice things like a man's shoes, or we're gonna forget things in bulletins, or we're gonna forget bigger emotional things. And so he needs to wake us up. So if you look at scripture, it's like every three paragraphs. There's, there's a warning, a reminder, a prophet, a martyr, a disciple, an apostle. There's something telling you, here's the problem, here's how it's going to be fixed, over and over and over and over. Because he knows. Well, if I just tell you like five times, you know you're going to be like, okay, go back to bed, right? And apparently that wasn't enough, all those things I just listed, so he sends his son, he said, fine. I'll come down there and I'll show you personally. Because I know if you hear things over and over and over, right? Some of us, mostly us men probably, hear things and then we forget them because we've heard them so many times and we don't think about it. I do it all the time with Bethany. I'm working on it. I didn't want to pick on the guys, but I just know where I'm coming from. 
But God sends his son on top of everything else, on top of scripture, on top of the church's proclamation to say, look, there's an issue. Let's solve it. Here it is. Here's how I'm going to do it. And so he gives us this new lens to see. He says, look at the man's shoes. Recheck the bulletin. Make sure you actually look at the details and keep looking at them because you need to see with new eyes. You need a new lens to see because you are covered in darkness. This is where the Gospels come in. And in, and in particular, today's prologue, the beginning of John's Gospel, one of the best pieces of Scripture ever written. In my Greek class in seminary, you know what passage we did as our introductory passage to learn how to read Greek? John 1, 1 to 18. I was just watching The Chosen, if any of you have seen that. Last night, this is ironic divine coincidence. You know what episode they were talking? It was season two, episode one. You know what he was doing? It was John writing the prologue. And I was sitting there going, really? I'm preaching on that tomorrow. That's pretty cool. It's a pretty good series, by the way. Check it out. But this prologue is given primarily so that we would have a lens, a way to see in a new way what God has done and is doing and will do. Not only in the world, of course, but in John's gospel. 21 chapters. John sets out from the beginning. He says, look, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to write 21 chapters, but I want you to think of the 20 and a half chapters that come after the prologue through the lens I give you now. And he starts off on a cosmic scale. He doesn't just say, hey, there's this guy, right? And he did some things. He's like, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Now, he doesn't say Jesus, but we all know in hindsight, he's talking about Jesus. And so what is he saying from the very beginning? Literally. Jesus is God. Don't be confused. Don't miss it. He'll, he'll kind of build it up through these next 18 verses, but God and the Word were together in the beginning, and there was creation, and there was light, and there was life. And where did it come from? God. And who is also God? Jesus. He's not just some guy who had some fancy things to say, some wise words, as people like to say. It wasn't some guy who just came on and was like, oh, I want to help people who are in need. He did those things. I'm not trying to be trite about it. But Jesus is God. This is the lens. John says, I want you to read the whole gospel, and every time you hear Jesus or see Jesus, I want you to go, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Because as John tells you in chapter 20, the whole purpose for writing his gospel is what? So that you would see and believe for yourself. Everything that he written is true. But you can't do that unless you have eyes to see. So he doesn't want to mess around at the beginning. He says, you know what? I could tell you about Jesus in time and place as we've been talking with Luke, but I'm going to go bigger. In the beginning, here, all time, here's Jesus. Boom. He's God. Everything that comes after, every time you pray to him, every time you think about him, every time you talk about him, every time you write his name, you should think Jesus and God in the same sentence. A lot of people don't do that. It's hard, right? Habits. Jesus was a man. I think of him as a first century Palestinian Jew, and I go, um, he was a person. John's like, no, he's God. But now we're up here in the nether sphere, and we're like, oh, creation and God and cosmic whatever, power, light and life. So John's like, here, here's what I'll do. I'll remind you, we are in time and place in history. So he goes, from here, Jesus is God. I want to remind you, we're also, this is real. There was this guy, John. He's a human. He walked among you. He told you. He witnessed and testified to the truth about this. So that you can go, oh, it's not just some like myth or fantasy about some sky god. John was there telling you the story. Okay, I'm a little bit more comfortable, right? I mean, if, if, if some sort of phantasm or ghost or even spirit or God appeared out of nowhere and told you something, and then a human being walked up to you and told you, you'd be a little easier in understanding and hearing and maybe even believing when the human being that you can touch and see and walk after and eat with and, and whatever is telling you. So we needed to hear from a human. It makes so much sense that John came before Jesus because we needed to hear it first to be prepared. So he's brought it now down to our level. And then as we've been talking the last few weeks, yesterday, last Sunday, what does he do? Just like Luke, just like all the Gospels, just like God has done from the beginning. God's story 
and our story. He moves then into letting you know that, yes, God is creator of the universe. Jesus is there. He is light and life. He creates life. He brings light. Woo! Jesus is God. And then John's down here doing his thing, but he wants you to know who else is down here. Jesus was in the world. And he's bringing his light and his life to share with people. And he wants you to know that. Because now he's doing it as human. Remember? What's the lens? What should I be looking through? Your new cataract, all of you, and your glasses and your contacts? You should be seeing now the rest of the story. Jesus is God, not just a human. He's human and God. And now he's here in the world, walking in flesh. And then he says the most astounding passage in probably all of Scripture. God became flesh. Not spirit, not fantasy, not myth, not some irrational mixture of all of that. He became flesh. God is now human and God. I don't know how that works, but it does. And he dwelt among us. Those of you who were in our John Bible study, and actually we just talked about this again in this last study, the word dwelt among us, the Greek is actually tabernacled or tented, right? It's the, 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 the image is, is Exodus. And when Moses was with the people and they had the, the tabernacle, the tent, what does it mean? God didn't just come and walk around and yell at us and tell us what to do. He was like, I'm going to set up a tent. I'm going to live with you guys and you ladies. We're going to talk. We're going to hang out. We're going to eat together. We're going to struggle together. We're going to celebrate together. You notice that? He's not some runner who's just running by your house going, hey, you should be nice to people. He's like, we're going to live together. Because as I said at the beginning, as I said at the end of Scripture, I'm going to dwell among you. Because that's what I want to do. That's what God wants to do. So God dwelt among us in the flesh. And then he just hopes, as John says, that in the midst of this, him bringing light, him bringing life, you looking through the lens that Jesus is God, that we will look through that and see in a new way and say, whoo, Jesus is God. And that we will, as he says again in chapter 20, he says at the beginning, we will believe and have faith. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to believe with this new lens that he is God and he has brought us our life and he has given us light so we can walk his path. Because the one we were walking before was our path and we've been over this a dozen times. It's not a good path, usually, if not almost entirely. God said, here's the path. I've given you life. Now I'm giving you light to shine in the path so you can get to where I want you to go, which is to be home with me. I'm going to do that through my son Jesus, who's coming in the flesh, in time and place and history. And because we are still, let's, let's admit it, how many of you still, even in your 60s, 70s, and 80s, you get excited at presents, right? Who doesn't? I was excited yesterday. We like stuff. We like being given things. And so we hear this amazing word, grace. Grace upon grace. What God has been doing from the beginning in creation, in light and life, through his son Jesus Christ, through the words of John, through his prophets and martyrs and apostles and disciples, is what? He has been unloading his free an infinite love on us. That's grace. Undeserved, free, unlimited gift of life and love and light. That's how it's all possible. We happen to be in Grace Church. It's a good name for a church. People come here often to be healed. Many people you know have come here to be healed. When you're healed, what are you receiving? The gift of God. When you hear or speak the word of God, what are you receiving and using? The gift of God. When you come here to hear me proclaim the word of God, what am I giving you? The gift of God. When you love one another, what are you doing? You're giving each other the love of God, which is the gift of God. And all you have to do is take gift and change it for grace. Everything is possible through the grace of God because we didn't deserve it because we didn't want to hear it. Remember? We're in darkness. We're blind. We need cataract surgery. <laughs> Or an updated glasses. We need a new way to see. And God said, here, I'll give it to you free. You want to know how much my cataract surgery costs? No, you don't. Thank you for paying for it, though. You took care of me. You took care of me. I don't know why, but you do. And that's a gift from God through you to me. As you know, surgeries are expensive. God gives it away free. Here's the way I want you to see. It's going to give you clarity and light in life. Just take it. It's free. You don't deserve it. 
I don't deserve it. It's free. Grace upon grace. And what does he mean? It's the revelation of God, of his love, of his, light, of his life. And how does he maximize that? How is, it, how is it kind of magnified? Right here. This is the pinnacle of it. Every time Jesus spoke and did things, primarily through the cross, that is the grace of God. I love you so much, unreservedly, that I will die for you. I love you so much, I'm going to tell you the truth. I love you so much, I gave you life. Remember, in the beginning was the word. I love you so much, I know you're in darkness, I'm going to give you a free flashlight. Here's the way. I'm actually going to be the way and the life and the truth. And then I'm going to give you that too. I'm going to give you truth. You're going to wander around this world and you're going to fight like angry dogs and cats at what is true. I'm going to tell you what's true because I created truth. I am truth and you've forgotten. So see through this lens. Jesus is God. He bears light and life. He is light and life. He is truth. And he gives this gracefully to all of us so that we can join in that. And in case we missed it, after 18 verses, he sums it all up, reminds us again, and clarifies it by actually saying the name. Jesus and God, the Father, are one. Inherently, he is again saying at the end, Jesus is God. At the end, he wants every one of us to go, oh, wow. He wants us to finally begin to see what God is and who God is and what God has done and what God is doing in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he wants that to do what? Give us a new way to see truth and life and light. And he wants it to change our lives as we move forward so that our lives can share the light and life and love of God in Christ and the Holy Spirit with every single person we touch and see and know and run into. Everyone including the ones we hate and disagree with and look down on and oppress, the ones we don't want to speak to. Those are included. This is the miracle of Christmas. None of us were deserved of a new cataract or new contacts or new glasses or even the ability to see, and God said, I love you, I'm going to give it to you. All you have to do is receive it. Take Christ into your heart. Let him show you the way, the truth, and the life. Let him remind you that he is God and he has set the path and he has given you the light and he has given you the life to walk it so that the world may know that Jesus Christ has come and is God today, tomorrow, and always. Merry Christmas.